This week's blog post is on the Plaster Cast Gallery in Springfield, Massachusetts. The Gilded Age mansions of the late 19th century were the homes of entrepreneurs who earned their wealth by advancing science, technology, and industry. You can see any of these homes by going to my website and pressing the Gilded Age Mansions tag. The same wealthy entrepreneurs established many of America's most prominent museums, including the Metropolitan Museum, 1870, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, also 1870, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, 1876, and the Art Institute of Chicago, 1879. But all the money in the United States couldn't buy enough top-notch art to fill those new museums. To allow Americans, including aspiring American sculptors, whom I mentioned in last week's blog post, to allow all these people to see great works without traveling to Europe, the museums bought high-quality plaster casts of famous works of art from Greek, Roman, and Renaissance sculptors. Firms in Boston, London, Paris, Berlin, Dresden, Florence, and Rome specialized in creating such casts at a one-to-one -one scale, meaning actual size. Among the museums that assembled a plaster cast collection was the George Walter Vincent Smith Art Museum, which was established in 1896 in Springfield, Massachusetts. Like most American museums, the Smith eventually chose to focus on original works. Its plaster casts were sent to storage in the mid-20th century. But in the 1970s, they were restored and placed back on display. The Smith has one of the largest plaster cast collections in New England. The casts represent beautiful works of art, and they are great teaching tools. For example, they illustrate several of the major innovations that I described in Innovators in Sculpture. In this post, I'm showing you a selection of the casts in chronological order and noting which innovation each one illustrates. This is the Discus Thrower by Myron, circa 460 to 450 BC. It's a great illustration of innovation number two, studying anatomy, and also of treating the body not as a collection of bits and pieces, but as an organic whole whose parts will change with movement. That's innovation number three. The primary view of this piece is clearly from the side, the photo on the left, and that's the way that it's always shown in the textbooks. But I've always wanted to see how the discus thrower looks head on, and now I have. Photo on the right. I've given you a link to more information on the discus thrower. Next up, the Parthenon pedimental sculptures, which date to the 430s BC. These are examples of the Parthenon style, which is also known as Phidias' style. Phidias was in charge of the artistic decoration of the Parthenon, which was the major building project in the Greek mainland during the second half of the 5th century BC. Established sculptors found work there, and young sculptors learned their trade there. Hence Phidias' style, which was idealized and calm, came to dominate Greek sculpture during that period. It's not an innovation, but it's a very long-lasting and influential style. See Innovators in Sculpture, Chapter 3.3. I've given you a link to more information on the Parthenon pediments. This is Hermes with Infant Dionysus by Praxiteles, 4th century BC. Innovation number four is breaking out of the box. And by that I mean that the figures no longer look as if they had been carved out of a simple upright rectangular human-shaped slab. Praxiteles, who sculpted this piece, was famous for creating figures that swayed to the side. And you can see the Hermes has a curve. This sculpture is also usually photographed from head-on, but I love being able to see it from other angles as well. And I've given you a link to more about the Hermes with Infant Dionysus. This one is the Ludovici Ares, the Mars of Ludovici, late 4th century BC. It also illustrates innovation number four, breaking out of the box. And you could tell that it's not a 5th century sculpture, not something from Phidias' time, by the fact that there's this little cherub sort of frolicking under his feet. That is not a 5th century BC thing to do. This one is called The Wrestlers for obvious reasons. It's the 3rd century BC. It's an even more extreme example of innovation number four. There's no chance that you would think this was in a box. And it shows a really nice mastery of anatomy. And yet the faces are still calm and idealized even though they're in, they're fighting each other. If you look at this face, this is a more or less 5th century BC face. That style, the calm, idealized style, lasted in Greek sculpture long after Phidias' Parthenon sculptures were finished in the 430s BC. 
I've given you a link to more on this sculpture. This is the Pergamon altar, circa 200 to 150 BC. Innovation number five in Innovators in Sculpture is showing emotion via facial expression. See especially the face of this figure, the eyebrows and the, and the way the mouth is open. Some examples of facial expression do appear during the 4th century BC, but the most vivid ones, such as this one and the Lao Kon, which we'll see in a sec, were created a couple centuries later. And of course I've given you a link to more about the Pergamon altar. This is the Lao Kon group, 1st century BC, maybe. It's an even more extreme example of innovation number five, showing emotion via facial expression. This is another sculpture that's usually only shown from the front, so I was happy to be able to see what's going on on the back. And of course, I've given you a link to more about the Laocon. With this Renaissance sculpture, we have an example of innovation number eight, rethinking everything. During the Middle Ages, artists tended to show over and over the same figures identified by the same attributes and in the same poses. See the beginning of chapter eight in Innovators in Sculpture. In the early 15th century, Donatello, who created this work, began reworking all the traditional subjects, including St. George, who's shown here before his battle with a dragon rather than in the midst of it, as he always was in the Middle Ages. This is yet another sculpture that's almost always shown from the front only. In the Middle Ages, art was didactic. It was meant to teach illiterate Christians biblical stories and lessons. This adorably light-hearted piece harks back to Donatello's choice in the early 15th century to create art for pleasure rather than for teaching. See chapter 8 in Innovators in Sculpture. Verrocchio's Puto with Dolphin dates to around 1465 to 1480, and I've given you a link for more information. This is Michelangelo's Dying Slave, created 1513 to 1516. Michelangelo's innovation was not a technique, but an attitude that a top-notch artist was not a mere tradesman, but a genius who should be allowed to set his own terms for what he creates. Who else but Michelangelo would have thought of placing a dying slave and a rebellious slave on the tomb of a pope? See chapter 9 in Innovators in Sculpture. And this is part of the Medici Chapel by Michelangelo, probably created around 1519 to 1534. It is Innovation 9 again, the artist is a genius who can set his own terms for what he'll produce, and when, and how. Here he did an idealized portrait of one of the ruling Medici family of Florence. To either side are dusk and dawn. Here's dusk, here's dawn. The two reclining figures are just a trifle too high here, which makes them a bit more emphatic than they are in the original, where the portrait sculpture is up all by itself. This sculpture, like many of those above, is usually only shown from one angle. But seeing only that angle, you miss details such as the fantastic ornament on the helmet. That's it for this week. DianeDurantyWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the free Sunday Recommendations email list, visit DianeDurantyWriter.com Sunday Recommendations or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on DianeDurantyWriter.com. As always, thank you for listening.